It's a great, great honor and pleasure for me tonight to introduce Michael McClure. We've been trying to get this program going for a long time, and I'm, I'm so delighted it worked out. Uh, it's also a slightly absurd task to introduce someone like Michael McClure, for this is that rare author who truly deserves the epithet of living legend. I could tell you some of the major points that are often trotted out. He, of course, helped inaugurate the Beat Generation at the consciousness-shattering Six Gallery reading in 1955. His plays have prevailed over censorship on more than one occasion and have gone on to receive Obie Awards and other honors. He co-wrote the American folk staple Mercedes Benz with Janis Joplin and, as Ashley mentioned, had a long and amazing performance collaboration with Ray Manzarek of The Doors. I could tell you how admired and lauded he was by the likes of Robert Creeley, Allen Ginsberg, Charles Olson, and countless other literary and artistic giants. Gary Snyder has called his work just the tip of the iceberg of aesthetic and spiritual energy that is a small but still hopeful counterforce to institutionalized global banditry. Stan Brackage wrote, McClure gives his reader access to the verbal impulses of his whole body's thought as distinct from simply and only brain think as it is with most who write. Diane De Prima perhaps gets to the heart of it best in her simple yet profound accolade, the one that all poets want. There is no other poet like Michael McClure. And I must tell you that in a career whose laurels he could have rested on long ago, he shows no sign of ceasing and his work seems more vital than ever. His recent books, and by recent I mean in just the last few years, include Mysteriosos, which he calls a response to our unending war against nature, Of Indigo and Saffron, a brilliantly edited selected poems put together by the late Leslie Scalapino, that also contains a soaring new sequence of over 100 pages called Swirls in Asphalt. And Ghost Tantras, a seminal small press work from 1964 that has been restored to glorious print with a new introduction and that continues to serve as a dazzling manifesto for a poetry of pure beauty and energy. I could say all these things, and I just did, painfully aware that they only hint at the extraordinary depth and generosity of this artist and how lucky we are to continue to be the recipients of the spells of protection and compassion he still weaves. Please join me in welcoming Michael McClure. Oh, I see old friends out there, and new ones, I hope. Uh, <clears throat> it is right to give May Day thanks to Alan Kornblum and to Coffee House Press for publishing and printing of poetry of inspiration and imagination, and to understand the vigor of this success and the hundreds of books created, Alan Kornblum and Coffee House Press can only be compared to New Directions and the publisher Jay Laughlin, or to Grove Press in its heyday under Barney Rossett, and to City Lights Press with Lawrence Ferlinghetti. And thanks also to Eric Lorber for his energies devoted to raising the banners of poetry in a transnational way, especially regarding Rain Taxi, which he maintains and is one of the most varied reflections of the present art of poetry. Thank you, too, and all of those who helped you. Tonight, I'm going to start with a few sentences from an introduction of one of my latest books, which I think is appropriate tonight. 
We human mammals hate and love what we gorgeously, no, we human mammals hate and love that we are gorgeously out of control and also compressed into distracted and pained social shapes. But there is alchemy. As long ago, Friedrich Schlegel said, all poetry should become science and all science become art. Poetry and philosophy should be made one. A poem is a porthole of consciousness and experience, whether opening the feeling of blood pulsing in the wrist or the taste of a red-black cherry or the sound of a rock being placed on a table. When I speak of science, I'm speaking of science which is inaugurated by the biological sciences. Tonight, I want to start with reading one of the poems I read in the first poetry reading I gave in 1956, the night Allen Ginsberg read Howell, and the night that Philip Lamontia was there, and Gary Snyder was there, and other friends of mine, like Kenneth Rexworth was a master of ceremonies. Jack Kerouac was in the audience. And I read a poem, moved as I was, by California Nature, which I had just begun to see down the coast at Point Lobos and at the ocean edge, called The Mystery of the Hunt. It's the mystery of the hunt that intrigues me that drives us like lemmings, but cautiously. The search for a bright square cloud, the scent of lemon verbena, or to learn rules for the game the sea otters play in the surf. It is these small things and the secret behind them that fill the heart, the pattern, the spirit, the fiery demon that link them together and pull their freedom into our senses. The smell of a shrub, a cloud, the action of animals, the rising, the exuberance when the mystery is unveiled. It is these small things that when brought into vision become an inferno. And then a seminal poem in my life. This was written during my first peyote experience. Peyote poem. Clear. The sense is bright. Sitting in the black chair. Rocker. The white walls reflecting the color of clouds moving over the sun. Intimacies. The rooms, not important, but like divisions of all space, of all hideousness and beauty. I hear the music of myself and write it down for no one to read. I pass fantasies as they sing to me with Circe voices. I visit among the peoples of myself and know all I need to know. I know everything. I pass into the room. There's a golden bed radiating all light. The air is full of silver hangings and sheaths. I smile to myself. I know all that I, there is to know. I see all there is to feel. I am friendly with the ache in my belly. The answer to love is my voice. There is no time, no answers. The answer to feeling is my feeling. The answer to joy is joy without feeling. The room is a multicolored cherub of air and bright colors. The pain in my stomach is warm and tender. I am smiling. The, ma the pain is many-pointed without anguish. Light changes the room from yellows to violet. The dark brown space behind the door is precious, intimate, silent, and still the birthplace of Brahms. I know all that I need to know. There's no hurry. I read the meanings of scratched walls and cracked ceilings. 
I am separate. I close my eyes in divinity and pain. I blink in solemnity and unsolemn joy. I smile at myself in my movements. Walking, I step higher in carefulness. I fill space with myself. I see the secret and distinct patterns of smoke from my mouth. I'm without care, part of all, distinct. I am separate from gloom and beauty. I see all. I'm not even afraid of the things shorn of glamour, but accepting. The beautiful things are not of ourselves, but I watch them, among them. And the Indian thing, it's true. Here in my apartment, I think tribal thoughts. Stum ache. There is no time. I'm visited by a man who is the god of foxes. There's dirt under the nails of his paw, fresh from his den. We smile at one another in recognition. I am free from time. I accept it without triumph, a fact. Closing my eyes, there are flashes of light. My eyes won't focus but leap. I see that I have three feet. I see seven places at once. The floor slants, the room slopes, things melt into each other. Flashes of light and meldings. I wait, seeing the physical thing pass. I'm on a mesa of time and space, writing the music of life in words, hearing the round sounds of the guitar's colors, feeling the touch of flesh, seeing the loose chaos of words on the page. Ultimate grace, sweet Yeats and his ball of hashish. My belly and I are two individuals joined together in life. This is the powerful knowledge. We smile with it. At the window, I look into the blue, gray gloom of dreariness. I am warm into the dragon of space. I stare into clouds, seeing their misty convolutions, the whirls of vapor. I will small clouds out of existence. They become fish devouring each other and change like Dante's holy spirits, becoming an osprey foes in the sky high to challenge me. That was 1957. Hmm. Two weeks baby sunbathing. This old brown velvet, by daylight, is not eternal velvet. But the baby on it, bright in the morning sun, is more beautiful than human. Her glory fills the room. Her back and buttocks are mounds of color. Her toes and fingers are fat stars. Light streams between the drapes. And incandescent, she changes it to orange, to pink reflecting on the face bent over her and gleaming from the leaves of the houseplants. This is for one of the saints in my pantheon. Ode to Jackson Pollock. Ode to Jackson Pollock. Hands swinging the loops of paint, splashes, drips, chic lavender, duende black, blue and red. Jackson Pollock, my sorrow is selfish. I won't meet you here. I see your crossings of paint. We are all lost in the cloud of gestures. The smoke we make with our arms, I cry to my beloved too. We are lost in lovelessness. Our sorrows before this, copy them in air. We make their postures with our stance. They grow before us, the lean black she-wolves on altars of color. We search our remembrance for memories of heroic anguish. We put down our pain as singing testimony, gouges, corruptions, wrinkles, 
hell loose in the net of our feelings and hues. We crash into the machinery, making it as we believe I say, we, I, you, you saw the brightness of pain. Ambition, we give in to the lie of beauty in the step of creating. Make lies to live in, I mean you, held yourself in animal suffering. You made your history of pain, making it real for beauty, for ambition and power. Invented totems from teacups and cigarettes. Put it all down in disbelief, waiting, forcing. Each gesture painting caught on to the method of making each motion your speech, your love, your rack. And found yourself. Heroic, huge, burning with your feelings like making money makes the body move. Calls you to action, swirling the paint and studying the feeling. Caught up in the struggle and leading it for the beauty of animal action and the freedom of full reward. To see it down and praise and admiration, to lead, to feel yourself above all others. No matter what, it's there. No one can remove it. Done in full power, liberty in Jackson Pollock, the creator, the mind is given credit. You strangle the lean wolf beloved to yourself guardians of the secret, and found yourself the secret spread in clouds of color, burning yourself and falling like rain, transmuted into grace and glory, free of innocence, containing all, pressing experience through yourself onto the canvas. Pollock, I know you were there. Pollock, do you hear me? Spoke to himself, beloved, as I speak to myself, to Pollock into the air and fall short of the body of the beloved hovering, always before him, her face not a fact, memory, or experience, but there in the air, destroying confidence, the enormous figure of her mystery, always there in trappings of reason. Worked at his sureness, demanding her place beside him, called from the whirls of paint, asked for a face and shoulders to stand naked before him to make a star. He, pulling the torn parts of her body together, to make a perfect figure, 1951. Assembled the lovely shape of chaos, seeing it bare and hideous, new to the old eye, stark black and white, the perfect figure lying in it, peering from it, and he gave her what limbs and lovely face he could, from the squares, angles, loops, splashes, broken shapes, he saw of all with bare eye and body. In 1951, Pollock went back, after a period of inability to paint, went back to, uh, from, and changed from the drip style to a kind of huge painting on canvas. It was actually dripped painting on canvas, but it was a painting of figures. And he kept trying to paint, and painting, what I think was his beloved, the, the, the female figure that he divined with love. And uh, this is to celebrate that. I felt some of the same things myself. And that painting I'm referring to, the, the painting of the lean black she-wolves, is a painting I grew up with in the San Francisco Museum. This is from a book of little odes. The far dart, oh, excuse me, from a little book of little odes. Hummingbird ode. The far darter is dead in my hand. The beautiful shabby colors. And the damp spots where the eyes were. Small form that was all spirit, smashed on the plate glass window. The green head and ruby ruffles. The beautiful shabby colors and the damp spots where the eyes were. All head and chest and the Eero spear of the beak moving like Cupid in the fuchsias. Hummingbird and spike of desire. The huge chest and head and the beautiful shabby colors. Tiny legs thrust back in the last stiff agony. What's on your side of the veil? Do you dip your beak in the vast black lily of space? Does the sweetness of the pain go on forever? 
Is there courage there in the night? Where are the loves that make the blossom of your body? Do they still spin in the air? Your wives and loves? Are you now more than this meat? Finally, a star? Can you hear okay? <laughs> All right. This was written long, 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 long ago before the beans at Wall Street. Maybe it's a preview. It's for Allen Ginsberg. It's called Cold Saturday Mad Sonnet. On cold Saturday, I walked in the empty valley of Wall Street. I dreamed with the hanging concrete eagles, and I spoke with the black bronze foot of Washington. I strode in the vibrations of money strength in the narrow, cold, lovely chasm. Oh, perfect, chill slot of space. Wall Street, Wall Street, mounted with dead beasts and men, and metal placards greened and darkened, and a cathedral at your head. I see that the men are alive and born and inspired by moving beauty of their own physical figures who will tear the vibrations of strength from the vibrations of money and drop them like a dollar on the chests of the Senate. They step with the pride of a continent. Well, I met Ray Manzarek many, 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 many years ago because of uh, my friendship with Jim Morrison. And here's a poem for Jim Morrison, written shortly after his death. O oh, muse, sing that I be me, be thou, be meet, be me, be I. No ruse, a mammaled man, and stand with rainbow robes that drop away and globes that float in air about my hand. A universe in figure eights swirls about my head in flashing neon-lighted dots and blurs and spots and heavy lines of triumph energy that lie within my skin. I raise this knife, this wand with blades so thin. I lie upon a circled, polished table and leap up to be myself again. O oh, potency, to be my self-soiled soul, spirit again, and nothing more. Dark brown eyes of seals. The crunch of guilt within the neck bites muscles of the jaw at memory's sight of what, is, of what is beautiful of sexuality and bliss. This takes the silent, active shapes of secrets deep within, and then we do not know what is out or here or in. The memory itself is an infant's phantasm locked in living out a strangling or a luscious kiss that swirls in dripping chocolate and gentle hurricanes of milky arms and breasts. The unknown pseudopods entwine to make our spines in streaming jewels just as each higher cell has become a pulsing pirate chest wherein are sleeping wolves and angel fools and all this coils and intercoils and we stand on tiptoe to bend and see our heels. The air we breathe with deepening breath is alive with birth and death. We're held by the living arms of gods and moving through the summer waves we're watched by dark brown eyes of seals. Thank you. 
Here's one of the first poems I wrote from my wife, Amy. Rose Rain. Rain on the roses. Blue sky and you on my mind. Nothing could be kinder. I'm finding the way. Let's play each day like mayflies in December, like stars in the eternal sky. I may speak forever. <laughs> I want you to do that. This is for another hero of mine, Jane Fayon. He was another great but unknown painter, and now he's been rediscovered with her having showed. Oh. Uh, this is a poem for another friend, for another hero of mine, Jay DeFeo, who was uh, one of the great poets of the San Francisco Renaissance and East and West Coast scene. And she was so modest and so brilliant that she disappeared from public purview for many years, and then many years after her death, just I think last year, was rediscovered and giving a, given a show at the Whitney. And now her, she, her works are much sought after. <clears throat> anyway, this is for Jay, for Jay DeFeo. Dark Contemplation. Agnosia. Dark Contemplation. Let me kneel to thee. Let me kneel to thee, for I have become as shallow as a small stream that trickles through the rocks and the clay where the punch grass grows, and the sun cups open their petals and smile with their sex at the sky. I know less than the small fly who lands on the red veined stone. Now I'm ready to know, for nothing is known. My heart is a worn sheet of virulent vanities. Each small step forward laughs with the cynicism of tragedy, and I sense there is something dark of me. And I sense there is something dark of me that must now be quiet and silently roar. And I would bow my head to all things that I've never seen before. And to this creature in the cave who blinks and sniffs in the sun, I hear from long ago that I and my thoughts are one. Thank you. Thank you. And as, and as I imagine most of you know, uh, mm, one of my creative partners, Ray Manzarek, the pianist, uh, died very early this year. And this is a piece dedicated to Ray. And it, <clears throat> this cloud is a life. As a great horned owl hoots, three calls. The pony of memory tramples the rattlesnake. Sunset colors of apricot and layers of black over the ocean. A puff of summer dust where the buckeye butterfly lands. Mystic wings of planets and scarlet nebulae. A lock on the machine gun under the bed. Faces twisted in pain. From the old times when love hurts so much that it is spotlights filled with legs and mouths writhing. Nylon stockings filled with sentimental songs are stained with blackberry juice like my fingers. And I love you, your blue eyes, Amy. 
crinkle of frost on the windows. This is all fog off the ocean coming over the line of brown hills. Tailgating drivers behind me with stoic faces of Arnold Schwarzenegger. The city is a mammal vision in cheeks, peaks of fog. Jack Pumpkinhead laughing with the Tin Man. And an axe chops through it all, showing the dry grain and the whorls. Raphael found the rules and was freed. A few haikus. Ah, I was shown, I was shown what a haiku was by my friend Philip Whalen, who later became a Zen Roshi. His, his haiku said, I mean, his, his haiku said, uh, um, for Mike, <laughs> um, a bouquet of huge nasturtium leaves. How can I support myself? Another haiku. Hey, it's all consciousness. Thumps of assault rifles and the stars. Another haiku. Moldy board smell. Ah, my grandpa's face appears in the air. Another haiku. Hey, driver, your big, soft, steel, rubber-smelling car owns you. Oh, here's one for Bruce Conner since he had that wonderful show here in the year 2000. No, he, he died last year. Um, for Bruce Conner, this is, I suppose this is obscure because nobody out here, nobody anywhere maybe would know what the Avalon was. The Avalon was a big dance hall in San Francisco that the most madcap light shows, many of them done by Bruce Conner. Butterflies swirling madly. Ah, light shows at the Avalon. Plumstone. These are Zen poems. Plumstone six. Vain, vanity, vanitas, as a black river is vain with white rocks. Vanity makes thunder in soft flesh, imagining nothingness. The gleaming face held high descends to the crowd. Dragon Slayer arrives. Blue silver waves crash loud. Water lashes and swirls. The same story rolls over and over, giving meat to another body. Compassion, O oh wise one, for these scattering skulls and crude jagged stones. Bring quiet to Lorca and the unending memories of tiny black beetles and pink seaweed of crusty coral at the shallow edge of the pool. All one. A black river is vain with white rocks. Vanity, vanitas, wisdom, compassion in the smile of the dragon, in the slayer and the slain. Mouse tracks on the snow, painted in childhood books and screams in the air. Palm joined a palm, head bent in a bow. 
I love you when I love you only later a belief hiding another I swirl at the center with folded legs while the rooster crows vanity vanitas a black river is vain with white rocks all one thank you You don't need to worry about disturbing me. <laughs> now these are from uh, these are more recent poems. I heard these are all for Amy. No more ferocity for lunch. The shadows of teeth are enough to frighten tiny creatures into trembling in the shakes. The tall purple irises at the door to the cave are a torch lit to honor us if we sleep there on the heaps of gold coins. But I would rather kiss your finger in our hideout than be rich for 10 trillion years where the lion roars. I polish the stars off my boots their skin now, faces of Rembrandt and Shakespeare on their tops, speak to one another, covered with the comedy of bruises and torn nails. Smell of lime from the squeezed rind mixes with stardust settling around the rusty refrigerator lying on the hill. We are here in the car roar, in this instant between the changing of climates and the love we claim with our presences. How badly we need love to invent it. We pretend to be billowing clouds of flesh, giving morning kisses on the backs of our necks. We are floating suspended in honey like cupids in amber. Listen, the whales are singing very clearly in our hearts and there's a blade of violet light on the window ledge. In the painted chamber with the niches is a moment of the passion we embody and our tiredness and the rest and calm. A cardboard bucket of popcorn and car crashes is with us in the darkness and the waterfall. The loud noise is all around in universal directions and we are warmly touching. You float down the long carpeted flight, a movie goddess in high sandals. We belong. This space is our nation. Elsewhere are stars and sunlight. Thank you. Thank you. It's easy to lose track of time up here. Um, <clears throat> I want to read. I want to read a quote from Robert Duncan. Again and again. Worm like an ideology, he eats of the core. Aphids like retractions devour. Grass, bush, or tree in flower serve as reminder. Wind old theme of the poem, step by step, dance to the rewinding measures, the fresh shoots of war. 
And one more short quote by William Blake. Pluck thou my flower, Uthun the mild, another flower shall spring. Crossing the international date line by air. I'm black. Black in my crossing the international date line by air on our way to India. I'm black, black in my core, though one eye of light peeps inside of me. The waves of blackness enter and return in the same instant. The blackness inside of salmon or a root of peyote. My shoulders are decency and interdecency penetrating like wisdom and compassion. Liberation is one single freedom or not. It is not moving pictures, not big time sports, not the technicolor terrorism of consumption on the glittering screen in front of me on the back of the seat ahead. Thank you. Dancing on, this continues sitting there dancing on snakes heads, moving through my life in these airports. Every being is a babe on death row, even the worms building missiles. This was one of the great experiences of my life. In, in Kuala Lumpur, on our way to India, we had a day off. I, I mean, in Malaysia, we went to Kuala Lumpur and they have a butterfly garden there, which is an enclosure, enclosure filled with butterflies. And they're flying around you in little flocks. They'll even land on you if you're not careful. It's a good idea. The butterfly garden in Kuala Lumpur. My, my slow flapping heart flies where floating flights of butterflies by the waterfall, leave me high. High in this butterfly enclosure, I love you beside me in your green and damson sari. And we were traveling around South India a bit and went to the coast to what would be the Indian Yellowstone Park, I guess called Nagarhole Park. This luminous roadbed of red silver clay, alight with the sun of India, once performed in erotic dances of ancient stars. Our car jogs past park deer, peering from the shade of teak trees and brush, while a jungle fowl preens his green black tail for his ladies. The elephant charges, shrieking in rage, and our aged guide, the Anglo-Indian colonel, shakes one, fingers out, one finger out the car window. Stop, he shouts to his old friend. Stop, and she does. And she stares short-sightedly from wrinkled eye bags, and she turns away from us, then swings back and bellows her jaw-shaking trumpet blast and shuffles away sideways into the swinging branches. By the lake, a white-headed eagle glides over as we sip sugared instant coffee. For Ernesto Cardinal, The souls have no value. They are fox furs that we drape over well-fed arms and shoulders. But still they are hard-earned and long-sought by those with the luxury and energy to torment and to love them into being. Still, we are warm stones, and we smell ourselves in the screeching rain of cluster bombs on Iraq. 
Souls have no worth except as red splatters on walls and gobbets of meat and fox furs. Yo, not me, says the lithe cherub on his skateboard, tearing open a high-protein bar. Not me, says the sweaty chicken as her beak is snipped off at the factory farm. Not me, says the antibiotic, heaved into the pig feed with sheep carcasses and blood-clotted paper from the slaughterhouse floors. What are souls when small wars are the art form of presidents? Grr. We know, don't we? Madam Secretary. In the bedroom, their starving faces and big-souled eyes slide at the edges of television. What miracles of firearms and machetes allow children to morph into vain, bursting, bulge-chested heroes putting bare feet on landmines? Now a fat woman, the secretary of deceit, cuddles a child amputee to her breasts and croons of the need for democracy to flourish. I'm awed by her demon face as it leans out falling from the glass-fronted box and crashes with a squeak on the floor, spreading a scarlet pool. Mysterioso One. Lovely, lovely and ancient and foxed with rusty brown spots as the oldest immortal princess. Or the Bodhisattva Kwanan as a simpering and infinitely generous old whore. How surprised we are at what passes in past and future for the scent of apples. I must know more about the skin and muscles and the wall of stars two billion light years long. It is all quick. Build, build bold, loving arms. Build new love, over and older. Boulders on the seashore, build with the feckle smell of the final wreckage and roaring, smoking destruction. Morph the feared and debased into the luxury of consciousness as a microbe on a wet boot sole in a movie theater, creates the energy of stars. Now we are eagles in the realm of eagles' wings. Now we are automatons of reductionist technology. Build life, build death, free of the wheel. You've heard about my roar, you know. <laughs> um, this, this is a source of it. I wrote a book. I, I, I transcribed a book from a ball of silence that was speaking to me uh, in uh, 1963 in the midst of a trip to Mexico. And uh, I began writing down what the voice said. Or what, it wasn't, well, I began writing down the sounds that came from the ball of silence. Um, I think I should read it to you. I think I, sh I think I should read you the new, oh, anyway, that book was published in, I published that book myself in 1964. There was no coffee house around to do it for me. Uh, and so I had to do it myself. And uh, did it proudly because Shelley had done the same thing. Shelley had published his own first editions and fortunately, fortunately he didn't review them himself, although uh, Whitman did that. Uh, and you know what Whitman said? He said, uh, wait, he said, uh, oh, this is so great. 
He said, Whitman said, a mouse is miracle enough to stagger sextillions of infidels. That puts it right out there, doesn't it? So here's the introduction to the first edition. Oh, so anyway, 50 years later, pardon me, I got sidetracked. 50 years later, uh, City Lights decided they would like to republish this book of sound po of peace language poems that I had published myself in 1964, and it happened to be 50 years later. I was talking to my friend, the composer, Terry Riley, and he said, that's perfect. It's 50 years since I composed In C, which was his wonderful piece of music that changed, brought up minimalism in music. Uh, anyway, this, this is the book I was originally reading from. This is my uh, selected poems, uh, edited by Leslie Scalapino from University of California Press. Then I was reading from Mysteriosos and other poems recently published by New Directions. And now I'm about to read to you from Ghost Tantras, anciently published by myself, and this year republished by City Lights. And here, here's the introduction to the first edition. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take some time reading this. Introduction to the first edition. You never heard anything like this before. These are my personal songs, but anyone can sing them. Pronounce them as they are spelled, and don't worry about details. Use a natural voice and let the vibrations occur. They come from a swirling ball of silence that melds with outer sounds and thought. They were written in kitchens and bedrooms and front rooms and airplanes and a couple in Mexico City. Their purpose is to bring beauty and change the shape of the universe. Look what they've done. I was here and I liked it. It was all okay. There was, I was here and I liked it. It was all okay. I suffered. There were scents and flowers and textures, beautiful women. I was a handsome man. I invented love. I radiated genius for those who saw me with loving eyes. I was happy. I laughed and cried. Constantly new sights and sounds. I trembled and sweated at the sight of beauty. I laughed at strong things because I loved them, wanting to kick them in and make freedom. When I'm go, I'm gone. Don't resurrect me or the duplicates of my atoms. It was perfect. I'm a sheer spirit. And it continues more in description of the poet of the ghost tantras. <clears throat> Poetry is a muscular principle and a revolution for the body, spirit, <clears throat> and intellect and ear. Making images and pictures, even when speaking with melody, is not enough. There must be a poetry of pure beauty and energy that does not mimic but joins and exhorts reality and states the daily higher vision. To dim the senses and listen to inner energies a roar is sometimes called a religious experience. It doesn't matter what it's called. Laughter as well as love is passion. The loveliness the nose snuffs in air may be translated to sound by interior perceptive organs. The touch of velvet on the fingertips may become a cry when time is stopped. Speed like calmness may become a gentle pleasure or muffled sound. A dahlia or fern might become speech in meditation. A woman's body might become the sound of worship. A goddess lies coiled at the base of man's body and pure tantric sound might awaken her. There are no laws but living, changing ones, and any system is a touch of death. Read these poems as, as you would read Lorca or Mayakovsky or D. H. Lawrence, but read aloud and sing them. These are spontaneous stanzas published in the order with which the net. These, these are spontaneous stanzas, published in the order and with the natural sounds in which they were first written. If there is an ooh, simply say a long, loud ooh. If there's a gar, simply, if there's, if there's a gar, simply say gar and put an H in. Look at stanza 51. It begins in English and turns into beast language. Star becomes star. 
body becomes moody, nose becomes nose. Everybody knows how to pronounce no, or vuna, or garumi. Pronounce sounds as they are spelled, and don't worry about details. Let individual pronunciations and vibrations occur, and don't look for secret meanings. Read them aloud, and there will be more pleasure. I was pretty surprised when I read the first one, after I'd written it. I looked at it and said, uh oh. It goes like this. It's, it's well, oh, here, this is it. This will tell you a little bit about it. Many decades ago in San Francisco, lying on the couch, reading the newly written first ghost tantras, as it un unveiled to my eyes and ears, I feel a ripple, maybe a shudder, of embarrassment and laugh at myself. Where is the beauty I expect after my ball of silence promising me 99 tantras to the goddess? I remember Robert Creeley's admonition to believe in the experience of writing the poem. When I look at the page again, it brings love looking for sugar. I know that there'd be 98 more of these, I'm sure of it. Next day goes Tantra 2 appears and speaks in beast language. The Tantra waves baby arms at me and gives me news of the great Tibetan poet Milarepa, who is imprinting himself on the poem, becoming a, quote, mystic experience, unquote. Yes, it is a mystic experience and is my self-experience which can be laughable as easily as loaded with torment. Maybe some beauty that I do not expect will occur in a different guise or body of words, and so forth. So here's the first one. And this is not what I expected, but Goor. 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 Ga. 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 Goor. Ga. Ga. Gear. 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 Ra 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 ga ra be not sugar but be love looking for sugar ga ra ra is something waking up i wonder <clears throat> Here's the second one. Here's the second ghost tantra. Pleasure fears me, foot rose, foot breath, by blar maku tar. Nope, tai tar. In the middle of the night, I dreamed I was a creature like the great Tibetan yogi Milarepa. I sang a song beginning Home lies in front of you, not in the past. Follow your nose to it. It had great mystic import, both apparent and hidden. I was pleased with it. Goor, 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 roo, pow, ah, blah. They continued to grow up. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> on August 6th, 1962, the day after Marilyn Monroe died, this ghost hunter appeared. Marilyn Monroe, today thou hast passed the dark barrier, diving in a swirl of golden hair. I hope you have entered a sacred paradise for full, warm bodies, full lips, full hips, and laughing eyes. Ah, 
Grrrr, roar, know that all, ooh, farewell, perfect mammal. Fare thee well from thy silken couch in dark day. Ah, grrrr, ah, roo, gar, na, ooth, is farewell, moor, drun, fara, rahur, 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 thee. Ah, oh, oh, thar, no, gru, rar. <laughs> well, you're still there. I'm going to jump from there to the ghost hunters in mid early middle age as they continue to grow. Hmm. I love to think of the red-purple rose in the darkness cool with the night. We are served by machines making satins of sounds. Each blot of sound is a bud or a star. Body eats bouquets of the ear's vista. Ga booty eyes, ears. Knows, deem thou, no, na, oh, roar, vor, na, garu, me, na, dru, search, na, thee. The machines are too dull when we are lion poems that move and breathe. When we grew, when we grew, Hundred Mike Toth Sharu three that no deemed as one Ethu's row. They are not immune to what's going on in the room. Here's one written during Schubert's Amadeus Quartet. One we draw here on the da thou me deep stock roar him for news meet on grahur in silans of viola sri shari. Ah, thee I love, tau thou ur run, drip poor note a me mior plan, plan, to read your thon, plan, plan. Thurin rash tu ur tau, tri thrash ha, mi bresh, mi breath yai, u thun drubesh methi, here down deep over and above, thy heart's ache, plan, plan dru, daur mrathri, where the unspoken voice speaks before the tears drip, thy message might be. wrote this. This does not make sense. Um, I, I once was at a party in New York many, many, many centuries ago. And uh, 
I, I was privileged to meet very briefly Mark Rothko, the great painter, a uh, field painter. And I thought, you know, maybe Mark Rothko is the only one who could possibly appreciate these poems because they're also fields of, war, of letters, you know. And I started appreciating them as that way. It's quite different. Here's one that became, matter of fact, if you want to see this one, if you'd like to see me reading this, The Four Lions, it's a, it's a brief sing-along, uh, about a five-minute sing-along at the San Francisco Zoo. And it was filmed by uh, public television. And uh, that is, if, if you look up my name, sometimes right afterwards it says, In the Lion House. And you ring that, you'll get it. It's a good five minutes. And I read this to the lions. I, I, this is not, maybe it's too profound for you to hear. I'm going to make an attempt. If my voice gives out, I quit. <clears throat> Oh boy, I can hear them. Oh. oh, by the way, if you saw the Bruce Conner show here, it was Bruce Conner who first recorded my reading of the Lions that, entered, that caused the public television to ask me if I could do it again. I said, if the Lions will, I will. And they sure did. We did it. Silence the eyes. Become the senses. Drive drool from the fresh repugnance. Thou whole, thou feeling creature. Live not for others, but affect thyself from thy enhanced interior, believing what thou carry. Thy trillionic multitude of gra, whooshes and silences. Oh, you are heavier and dimmer than you knew and more solid and full of pleasure. Gar, 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 Ga, 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 Thank you. Thank you. That is done at a full shout in the Lion House. Does, uh, does anybody uh, have a, a, a threat or a question or a, an attack or a compliment? Oh, I can't see you. Yeah, right. Uh, do you approach poetry differently now than when you first approached it? Many years ago. Cousin to the mold and mole, I stamp my feet, where the undine and the oozel meet, and gnash the hangnail of desire with stubby hands and pointed teeth. That's a real early one. And then there was a period when I thought I was Blake. <laughs> Ginsburg and I both had that problem. Wow. Um,
My mother said to me tonight that I am Ted dead. My mother said to me tonight that I am dead ten years, and bending o'er my crib she plat a multitude of tears. And yet I think that isn't right. Oh, mother, you're wrong. Or round about my bed would stand four angels deep in song. For when the ground is white with frost, the angels fly and sing. But when the ground is wet with tears, the empty forests ring. Oh, mother, mother, laugh for me. The earth is black and damp. And sing a final song for me and light a final lamp. So I went from that to a, a kind of full illumination in a class of, by, in, in a friendship with Robert Duncan, which began with a class, the first class he ever taught uh, in, a, in a college. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in, initiated then to uh, projective verse, as conceived of by Charles Olson, and as executed by Robert, not executed, as ordained and premiered by Robert Greeley. And um, I guess I grew from there. Did I answer you? In your presence, it's easy to feel the, the gravity of great, the great poetic vision, but I find that it waxes and wanes in my life. And what have you found that, that brings it on stronger, that, that grows it, and what have you found in your own life that kills it? Um, the reason that we adore and love poetry no, that's not right. Um, I find that, it, that reading inspired poetry makes me believe in whatever inspiration I have, whether, whether the inspiration I have is true or not, and whether the imagination I have is true or not. And I get that by reading Lorca, Mayakovsky, Blake, D.H. Lawrence, Olson, really, <laughs> don't uh, at all. I don't know if that helps, but I get we we get confirmation from reading inspired poetry, which is what Coffee House Books does, and what uh, Eric is doing with Rain Taxi. He's giving us an opportunity to look at those. Yeah, but yeah, it comes and goes twenty times a day. Somebody said, "Do you ever suffer writer's block?" I said, "Yeah, about five times a day," and that's true. Uh, Michael, uh, first, many thanks for your kind words about Coffee House. Uh, last year, we published Kenneth Koch's collected plays. Really? And uh, when he was writing, you were collaborating with many theater groups. Yes. Uh, and somehow that spirit of collaboration between poetry and theater seems to have disappeared. Would you comment on, on that period of, of exciting collaboration between poetry and theater and perhaps speculate on how we could revive it? Well, I wait on tiptoe with breath held for it to be revived. Um, it, it comes from Aristophanes, it comes from Yeats. It comes from puppet theater, it comes from cartoons, all kinds of foolishness. And um, I, <laughs> I'm, waiting. I'm waiting for that to be revived too. I would love to see theater that I truly enjoyed. Uh, not that I don't enjoy it now when I when get to see it, but much of it is theater of the past. Like when we go to the play, when we go to a play now, we go see No Man's Land by 
by Harold Pinter, which I saw in London in about 1970 uh, on, a, on a second run. Mm. I think maybe if we, if we train people to read Aristophanes, uh, Greek comedy, and if we encourage them to, oh, look at Lorca's puppet plays. Um, that, that, I think that would be a beginning again. <laughs> Can you do anything about it? <laughs> yeah, I know you will. Is that it? I wish I could have given you a better answer, Ellen. <laughs> I mean, a more cheerful answer. Simple question. I uh, remember seeing Robert Duncan's book for children that was about his cat, I think. I w I'm wondering whether you ever wrote um, poetry or play for children. Yes, I, uh, I wrote a play called The Boobus and the Bunny Duck, which was illustrated by Jess Collins, Robert's partner. And it was just published, I guess, last year in one of those god-awfully expensive limited editions. But it was uh, one of those miracles that had happened. It was from Arion Press in San Francisco, a very swanky and expensive publisher. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please come again.